going to start by reading you a poem by the wonderful Billy Collins. It's short. <laughs> Even when I am not playing, I think about the piano. It is the largest, heaviest, the most beautiful object in the house. I pause in the doorway just to take it all in. And late at night, I picture it downstairs, this hallucination standing on three legs, this curious beast with its enormous moonlit smile. I'd like to say right up front, I have no books to sell today, so this is not a commercial venture. The last I heard, there were six at the book bin. It's $22.95, and um, they've been very good about ordering them, and so has Amazon, which I don't patronize a great deal, but they've been very fast about sending them to people. So I have no books. You're relieved. When I, st when I started making notes for this talk, I was afflicted by too many possibilities, which is one of my character flaws. Uh, too many ways of talking about it, too many things to say, and I thought of a cartoon from the New Yorker, which reminds me of the crazy woman in the attic, and I asked that it be projected. I don't know if it's up there. Yes. <laughs> that's what pulling this together was a little bit like, and that's a little bit what my musical life is like. I'll tell you now as much as I can about surviving getting this book published. This is not a talk on how to get published. I don't know. Uh, it's always different with every book, with every person, and even with the country that you're working in. I had started in Canada and ended up in the United States at Willamette, God bless it. And um, the situation is different in each country for publishing. If you want to ask later about that in Canada, do. I won't dilate on it now. But a few things came together to prompt me to write this book. I was about 70 at the time when I began thinking about it. I'm much older now. You'll figure it out as this goes on. And I had been making music really all my life from in very different circumstances, um, secular, religious, for fun, taking lessons, and so on. And so it had been a major part of my life from second grade on. I also had been reading two books I recommend to you. One is Richard Power's wonderful novel called The Time of Our Singing. It's very thick, but it's about the history of music in America and racism. And the second one I would recommend is anything by Christopher Small. I was very influenced by his writings on music. His books came out more recently from Wesleyan University Press. One was called Musicking, M-U-S-I-C-K-I-N-G, his favorite word. And the other is called Music of the Common Tongue, Survival and Celebration in African American Music. The thing that attracted me about Christopher Small's work was his emphasis on music as an action, not an event not something encapsulated and putting, put over there to think about or remember, which of course we do, but more significantly about something that happens, that people make happen, and that in the process of making it happen, if there's in particular more than one person, which is his emphasis, and mine in the book, musicking with more than one person, something happens in the doing of it. He sees that experience as a metaphor for ideal human relations. 
you're cooperating, you can figure this out, you're all smart, you know metaphors, but the thought of what happens when people come together and make music, whether it's singing, oh, playing an instrument, whatever it may be, whatever the form, think of it as a metaphor for idealized human relationships. And Small is very articulate and rich in describing that persuasion of his. I tried to count up the number of my present companions in making music. It's something like 12 different people, some of them right here in this audience, um, who either sing or come to my house. I accompany them and they play violin. Every Monday we make music with violinists, um, a flute player, another violinist. The number is significant, and this has been really a blessing in my life here in Salem, which I'll just dilate for one second and say has astonishing musical opportunities, Salem. I went through elementary and high school where I had no band, so I didn't know anything about various instruments, no orchestra. This is elementary and high school, think and college, in fact. So it's really been all on my own with the help of teachers and partners now that I've evolved as someone who makes music. So I'm going to tell you the story as much as I can of how this book came to be. Bear with me for a minute while I find my notes. I have too many papers up here, that's the problem. <laughs> I don't know what they are. From about 2004 onward, I started writing um, essays about the experience of making music, inspired to do this partly by the writing of Christopher Small, whom I've already described to you. Now, in the course of doing that, um, I had to decide whether I had the confidence to try it. Well, that's a kind of pointless question. You do it or you don't. And um, I did the essays over a period of years from 2004. I'd started thinking about it a couple of years before that, up until the book came out last year. And during that time, as I would complete an essay, this is standard procedure I'm going through now. As I would complete an essay, revise it, look at it, think, could anybody be interested? I would submit it to a journal. In the old days, when I started writing, uh, you had a typewriter and you mailed it out. That was Canada. In the new days, much less comfortably in many ways, you either write it by hand, I wrote these by hand, these essays, and then put them on the computer. So you use a computer perhaps at some point, and then you submit your creation to a journal, and how do you find what journal? I mean, you're flying blind. You don't really have just the perfect person out there who says, I'm going to publish this for you. So you survey the internet, an exhausting task, because you don't know really the quality of the journals you're looking for. And ultimately you send out and you get rejections, you send out and you get rejections, you send out and get rejections. I've said this before, I used to keep track of rejections and when I taught at Willamette, I would always show my students my notebook and they were appalled. Sure that their great novel was just around the corner and they were going to make millions and they would see my rejection. So anyway, the process is you send out stuff, you get a rejection back, you resend it out. At one point in my life, I tried to keep 10 things in the mail at a time. 
That's a lot. <laughs> in any case, in April 2007, I had now been working on these essays, effectively working on them since 2004. I sent a proposal to an agent. I should probably mention I've had four agents in my life. Um, my last agent decided no longer to try to be an agent but for, for fiction, but to move over to children's literature because that was more profitable. That happened after I came to Willamette. Um, so I submitted what I thought now looked like a possible book to an agent in 2007. The answer was no. During this time, I was working on compositions for my granddaughter. Between the year, well, I don't really know that I can do between the years, but between her ages of one and 14, she's now 20, so you can do the math. Um, I composed each year a piece for her. And uh, it was an unexpected adventure that I took to try to do this. I'm going to see if I can do it without this, because you're all a blur to me. This might be easier. So between um, the years, her years of being one and 14, each year I set myself to compose a piece for her. Well, in the beginning, you know, you're sort of ambitious and you think, I'll whip off a little sonata. <laughs> but it got simpler and simpler in a way because after she got into school, um, preschool, I thought, no, we need words. I had just been um, composing and notating, which is tiring because I don't have the equipment to just bring up the notes on a computer automatically from the piano. I know all that exists, but I wanted to do it the old fashioned way and learn how you made the eighth notes, the quarter notes, the rests and all that. So I would notate her piece and then each year she would get it. She lives in Seattle um, when we went up there for her birthday. That went on for 14 years. So um, while I'm composing for her um, during a number of years, I am, of course, sending out what came to be an essay called Composing for Claire. This took time. Uh, I was also working on something I call Gregorian blues because I'm going to read a story later that deals with Gregorian chant, be still my heart, it, it'll be okay. But um, I was working on these Gregorian blues because I was taking improv from Julian Snow, to whom I've dedicated the book, a very gifted teacher. And he resides right here in Salem, as you know, and teaches part-time at Willamette and composes. So I was taking improv or studying improv with him because I really wanted to become free of notation, an old desire of mine as a pianist. And so um, I'll skip an episode that le led up to this, but I conceived the desire to learn how to compose blues. Okay, he said, sure, here's a sheet of paper. This is what you do. Now write down your first note. That's what he was like. So I wrote down my first note, terror. Oh, he said, that's great. Now write another one. So I started composing blues according to the formula for eight bar or 12 bar blues. I know I have musicians here, so I'm nervous about this. But at the same time, I also had always been very attracted to Gregorian chant and um, <laughs> I decided that what I would like to do um, was take some favorite sections of Gregorian chant and turn them into blues. And God bless him, he said, great idea, go for it. That's the kind of teacher he was. So I felt free to do that, and I rated my history of singing and teaching Gregorian chant, about which you'll hear more later and um, found little bits here and there from the Salve Regina or other sequences or hymns that I love, just bits, and made them into what I called Gregorian blues. This, was, this probably took me, 
I'm going to say three years. We're talking about extended time here between the composing, the notation, the playing them. Then one day I got a phone call from campus and he said to me, right now, if you can get over here within the hour, visiting students from around town are having a competition in various jazz playing. Uh, various groups were coming and they're going to play, some of them, your Gregorian blues. Do you want to hear them? Huh. <laughs> the difference between composing a story and hearing it read is significant. The difference between composing something and actually hearing it is just enormous. And I, so I had, of course, played them in my house and I'd subjected a couple of friends to come in and have wine and hear what this Gregorian blues was all about, but nothing like this. So I went to campus, of course, and it was total pleasure. They actually sounded good, you know, the one that, the couple that were chosen. So that's the background on Gregorian blues. So I'm composing for my granddaughter. This is all kind of simultaneous. We don't have clear cut sequence here. I'm composing for my granddaughter's birthday for 14 years. I'm taking improv for over 10 years, so. That's what's going on there. And meanwhile, I've been reading Christopher Small and thinking, hmm, there's a value in trying to write about this experience. I think some people might enjoy reading about it. I have never been a fan of memoir. I know that's a mortal sin. But I've just never read a lot of memoirs. Um, so. There are many workshops on how you write a memoir and so on. I thought, well, this is going to be about me. And, you know, that can be super boring. I'm not being fake here, super boring. But it really is about an experience of making music and how it transforms your relationships with other people and your sense of yourself, which is a little different focus. So helped out by small, I tried to focus on that. So now we're up to about 2011. And a Canadian friend suggests that I send what is now put together a number of essays, that I send it to a press in Canada. There's some Canadian connection, Gasparo Press. And they took nine months to respond and eventually wrote back, <clears throat> you want to watch out for compliments. That's, that's dangerous. Wonderful writing, um, memorable thoughts, no. <laughs> That's how it works. So this was about March of 2010. Then I had another suggestion. Well, that was in February. We're in the year 2011, actually. Um, now I'm still doing the composing for Claire. I'm still doing Gregorian blues. I'm still having partners come and make music at my home still trying to write the essays. Um, and another friend said to me, he was a very well-educated man up in Poughkeepsie at Vassar, and he said, we have a very close friend who's starting an independent press. I love independent presses. So it's going to be called Tangerine Press, and it's independent press, and they're looking for material. This man knew what I was trying to do with a collection of essays at this point. And so, um, why don't you send an explanation to this person, he gave me the info, and see whether they would take your book, which now really was looking like a book. By this time, I could see that there were many, many interconnections among the essays. Each one had a different subject, but all connected with what I've described to you. So he suggested I contact Tangerine Press, and I sent my material, some essays, my explanation of why I would be a winning publisher, you know, project for them. And then a few months passed, as I recall, just about two, which is short, and I got a letter back with a Canadian stamp on it, a real letter saying, we just loved your material. We wanted to publish it, but we've unexpectedly had a marriage breakup, and we're leaving America, and we're moving to Canada. In fact, right now, we are in our truck heading that way. <laughs> Sorry. 
So that was my second, you know, maybe major disappointment. Anyway, I went back to marketing and I then turned to a very good friend whom you know well named Ann Bowden. And as you may or may not know, she is an excellent editor. And so I asked her, <laughs> counting on her Christian charity and good heart, would you read through all these essays and tell me what you think? At this point, I'm really very perplexed. I'm still sending out essays and doing all the other stuff. But I want it done. I would like it in a book. So Anne, this is the year 2012, I believe. Anne does this over many months and offers a few excellent suggestions, which I won't share with you. Just know they were very good. Um, then, by accident, we're up now to 2013, and I have this pile of essays. And over time, I should add that I've gotten eight of them published in really good journals, including the Iowa Review, et cetera. And so I'm feeling this could work. I have eight solid essays published in good journals. So, you know, that gives you a kind of uh, base for your letter. By chance, uh, we had spent a year at the Institute for Advanced Studies, where my husband had a position for a year. So we had this unusual year, and I'm trying to remember the exact date, which is escaping me. Well, anyway, uh, we have a year at the Institute, and I'm free of children. They're both away at school. I'm free of all the duties I had had in Canada, which had to do with um, accompanying mass every Sunday, developing the music. And I'm also, um, apart from my duet partner there, I had a duet partner in Canada, Every Saturday morning, we worked for three hours together, a retired doctor. So I'm freed up. And so I have this marvelous year at the Institute for Advanced Study where I take improv piano with a very gifted teacher. And I also um, volunteer at a nearby Protestant church to play for them during their service. So when we came back from the Institute, we started getting their publications. They have an annual publication, OK. And just by chance, on a desk, I noticed this publisher named Paul Dry, publisher in Philadelphia. I'm still searching to whom I might submit this different book. And I very much liked his PR. So I decide I'll send him a letter. I'm going to read you the letter because I thought it would interest some people here who are going through the process of submission and what do you say and how do you present yourself. So this is April 2013, 10.30 AM. I write to the editor at Paul Dry Books. I seek a publisher for a music moir Keeping Time, product of several years' work, comprising eight interrelated essays tracing the significance of my making music alone or with, uh, with others over 70 years. The range is broad. From Gregorian chant, parenthesis, I spent 13 years as a monastic nun, to jazz improvisation, my current focus. Style and tone vary from reflective to straight narrative. Order is not chronological. <clears throat> Excuse me. Several essays have already been published in such journals as, and I name the journals. <clears throat> the current manuscript averages 60,000 words. At least one section needs editing and shaping, but I'm loath to undertake this until I have an interested publisher. Second paragraph. This is not a tell-all memoir, though it tells plenty. I have been a fiction writer for over 35 years, and then I refer him to my website, which is on the Authors Guild. 
am a survivor of agents, rejections, multiple publications in two countries. At 80, I see mortality, know something of the market, and am realistic. I do not wish to overload you with material, but should you judge this music more of interest to Paul Dry Books, I will quickly send an outline of the manuscript and overall assessment of possible audience and copies of essays. You have a totally intriguing list. The music more assumes a reader interested in aspects of playing, composing, dancing, arranging, improvising, and more, with references and insights into improvising in life and in music, and gradually learning the steps of survival in a world perplexing to the spirit. I am querying two other publishers it would be an honor if you would consider my work. I have always written under the pseudonym Ann Copeland. My actual name is Virginia Furtwangler. Thank you for your consideration. I include that just really for your interest, but you can see the kind of thing it's worthwhile thinking about. Who could possibly be interested? How many words is it? Uh, and all the other things that I cover there. A little bit of background, but not exhaustive background. So I happened when I sent that letter to be about to depart for England, where we were taking our granddaughter on a Rhodes Scholar trip arranged that you could take your grandchildren. So we were going to be in England for two weeks. So I sent that off and thought, oh well, bye bye, forget it. And eventually I got a one line reply saying, send the manuscript. I gathered he was a man of few words. I didn't bring a copy of his reply, but I can tell you what it was. This was the most promising response I'd had on the whole manuscript, send the manuscript. So um, I said that I would, I did that, and I got a reply back from Paul Dry that endeared him to my heart. He said, I have surveyed your manuscript and read it pencil in hand. How quaint. <laughs> so um, I'm greatly interested. By the way, says Mr. Dry, are you related to the great Furtwangler? My husband's reply to that is always, I am the great Furtwangler. <laughs> For those of you who know Al, that fits. Anyway, um, this is a funny pitch because, as you know, Furtwangler has is a very distinctive name in, in music because he was the conductor of the Berlin Philharmonic, Philharmonic and greatly loved for his, particularly for his Beethoven renditions. So it, my granddaughter now, an uh, excelling cello student at Vassar, she gets this all the time, Furtwangler. Oh, Furtwangler. So Mr. Dry immediately picks up on the name Furtwangler. Well, I don't use the name Furtwangler. So I write back to him and say, no, um, we're not directly related, blah, blah, blah. Then, when a little bit later, which is part of the story I'm going to get to pretty fast, when someone is editing this, he suggests that I exploit the name Furtwangler to get it edited, to, that, to get it published, I mean. And I thought, what? My whole life I had chosen to write under a pseudonym, Ann Copeland. There are reasons for that. And so uh, the name Furtwängler is a funny one in connection with a book like this of music. All right, that's my background on that. So Paul Dry says, send the manuscript. I send the manuscript. He reads it pencil in hand. And he says to me, I love your writing. Well, always distrust compliments. That's my advice to you. However, he says, um, it needs editing. Well, I knew that. It needs sharpening. I knew that. So I would suggest to you, we're in the year 2013, 2013 here, that you hire an editor. I could suggest a certain person who works with us, but I'm not promising a contract. He was very straightforward, very fair. I would like to suggest this name if you are looking for an editor. And secondly, I promise you no contract, but implicit in that is I'll look at it again 
have to. So three years went by, during which three years, every essay was edited with the help of John Corrin Sweat, the editor, excuse me, that he had recommended. And eventually, I believe in 2016, if I get my dates right here, yeah, in 2016, I submitted to the now edited manuscript to Paul Dry Books. I was very clear, there was no contract. Of course, you live in hope. Um, meanwhile, we try to be smart. You know, I checked out the books that Dry had published, and I liked them. I thought they were a distinguished book, and he particularly won my heart because I am nuts about Marcel Proust, and he had brought out a very nice reprint of a book on Proust, so this is really stupid on my part, but I very much liked his books. So I sent off the edited manuscript, and in November 2016, it was rejected with the comment, it wouldn't make enough money to satisfy you or me. So hard-nosed dealer, he was right, and uh, that was kind of hard to take, but you move on. Meanwhile, turning back now to the project I had mentioned to you, called um, Composing for Claire, my granddaughter, which took 14 years to really complete, one each year, and then notating. Um, I had been submitting that. I've left out a couple of anecdotes here, but there's one worth saying. There was a woman at an, at an academic institute who was very interested in it and wrote me a couple of times back about it. And then suddenly, the quality of her letters, this is pre-2017, the quality of her letters changed very strangely, or her emails. And I thought, oh, something's wrong. And then she wrote and said, I'm really very sorry, but I'm losing my eyesight. I've had a major concussion. And I'm going to a concussion specialist in some state. And so it was odd. But I had that funny instinct. She wanted the essay composing for Claire. She was interested in everything I had written. She had sent comments, but there was something strange about it. So that whole episode took some months to clarify. And in the end, she had to retire from teaching. And after all these years, now she's back teaching. So that was composing for Claire. Meanwhile, I submitted it to an independent press in Maine the essay, Composing for Claire. And usually I would say when I was submitting something to a journal, this is part of a larger project, and sometimes I would say of many years or not, but I would always say I envision it as a complete book. That's my visioning here. But would you like this single essay? So I sent Composing for Claire to Shanti Arts Publishing in Maine because I thought they did beautiful work. Um, I meant to bring an example today, but I don't think I remembered at the last minute. Um, but I, en I encourage you to look at their work. I was gonna say they designed the cover, but that's not the cover somewhere. <laughs> we have the cover. So Shanti Arts, um, Christine Cote is the very smart editor and publisher. I checked her out. She had, had, been, had quite an academic career at Bowdoin College, and she had lived in many different places in the United States. So she knew her way around geographically and academically. This is not a heavily academic book. I've made that clear to you. So um, in any case, I sent Christine Cote at Shanti Arts Publishing a, a copy of Composing for Claire, which she accepted and did a beautiful job on publishing in her journal, Still Point Arts Journal. Anyway, at the same time in her acceptance, she indicated interest 
and seeing the whole manuscript. Well, well, believe me, you jump on something like that. Interest, a little interest, a little interest. So I put together the list of all the essays and so on and so on and sent it to her and she accepted it. This is now near the end of my story. So in October 2018, um, Keeping Time, which she brought out through uh, Shanti Arts Publishing, was published. And I think I'm at the end of my story, except to say a couple of things that I think of now about editing. I'm sure many of you in this room have done editing. And maybe some of you in this room have longed to be edited. So my brief experience, I can make one or two points for what it's worth. There are different strengths in different editors. I've had many, starting in Canada. I remember the first time I got a manuscript back for the, one of the early books that had been edited, and I was so struck by the value of an editor. I was ignorant, you know, I'd sent my manuscript, it had been accepted, but now there was a, a very smart editor working with some of the adjectives and so on. So there's the kind of editor who is very good on cut that adjective, sharpen that verb, cut out the passive voice, very specific, detailed things. That's immensely valuable. Then there's the kind of editor which I think is rare. I had it in the um, book I wrote on fiction writing, the ABCs of writing fiction. I'm looking at the time there, it's okay. I was living in Canada, I uh, had taught myself how to write fiction, literally. I've never been to I've never been to a writing workshop where somebody taught me. But I thought I think I have another way, maybe, of writing about how to write fiction or learning to write fiction, other than there's character. Excuse me. There's character. There's scene. There's atmosphere. All those things count enormously, and you have to learn them. But I think there are so many other things one could say. So I'll just write an ABC of writing fiction, which I did. And in the, in the course of writing that, I had an editor, once it was accepted, the pr project was accepted, who, con who, who sent me the very old fashioned way I would send him from Canada to America, it was coming out in America, I would send him a section. This was all done alphabetically, so let's say R for rejection. And I write my words about my attitude toward rejection, how to deal with rejection, how not to die but pick up and go on, et cetera, et cetera. So we went through the alphabet with various words and he would write back to me, attaching it old-fashioned on the, you know, here would be my material, and here would be a whole attached thing from him with a stickum, some kind of big sheet, on which he would have written his thoughts. And the most valuable thoughts he would give me, aside from cut that adjective, okay, he wasn't big on that, would be press, <laughs> sorry, press harder in a certain spot, press harder. And that made perfect sense to me because I used to make that remark to my students in fiction writing. And what it means is you've got material here. It's promising. You're saying something. If you can just press harder on that iceberg underneath the prose that exists there, you may say something much more meaningful. And that came up in a story I'm not going to read today called Reunion, which some people have been quite struck by. The, um, it was the hardest story to write for your information if you look at the book. But it deals with a trip back as an older person to a college reunion. How universal is that? And the decision whether to go or not. And the discovery 
when there, a whole range of discoveries that you've changed, they've changed, ooh, they look older. But basically, you always discover something about yourself in the process. And I had gone back to the College of New Rochelle, Catholic Women's College, the oldest one in New York State, for my reunion. I can't even think of which one it was now, but it was 45th or something. I don't know. I went back from here to the reunion, and I had lots of ambivalence because I had been a nun teaching at that college in that order. Now I'm going back as a secular, married, in my very sexy dress, I hoped, <laughs> with slits up the side, folks. <laughs> so I'm going back to my reunion, and I'm going to see all my classmates. <clears throat> and I had been sort of a big shot in the college. I knew everybody. Uh, and so our class was not huge. But we were the golden anniversary class of the college. This is sort of a deal. And I go back, and I find myself. I had had 14 years of experience in the order, which none of them had had. They only knew the very fine order, actually, that taught us at this college from the outside, so to speak. So here I was, Ginny back, who had been their classmate. But in between, I've had this whole experience of being a nun in the order and teaching in that very college as a nun. So it's a very strange setup for me. And then we, um, some of the rules had changed, of course. So we're allowed to have a meal in a dining room in the nuns area that had always been off limits. So I'm riddled with um, levels and levels of awareness. So I'm sitting at the table with my buddies. Uh, one was married to G. Francis Liddy, um, and I'm talking to her, and another one is a doctor. We're with men. The women brought their husbands. Uh, mine chose not to come. So I'm there, and I've got men and women at a table in what was once like the nun's dining room. And I have lived in that as a nun, and none of them have. And I'm, think, I'm feeling riddled with comic possibilities, <laughs> riddled with them. I could really make them laugh. On the other hand, I could have been very boring. And I said nothing about that. And we chatted away, it was friendly, you know, and we talked about oh, life, liberty, and the pursuit of age, you know. But uh, I said nothing about really what I was feeling, all the contradictions in my own experience. It was my experience, not theirs, for one thing. But they had known all the nuns, the same nuns I knew. So I wrote this essay called Reunion. And after I came back, I probably waited a year, because it was a very strong experience for me. I was very glad I'd gone, uh, moved to tears. But I couldn't really say anything or verbalize anything about it. OK, so I send the essay to an editor. And it it's, uh, comes back to me. And the editor says to me, why didn't you speak? This is a perfect illustration of my point. I made the point in the essay that I had said nothing, but I didn't say anything about my motivation or any of that. Just went on with the essay about the experience of reunion, my experience. But he was very gentle. This is the man whom Paul Dry had recommended to me, who's editing now this book that wouldn't make enough money. In any case, it was excellent editing because he forced me to think about why didn't I speak. Uh, well, there were a lot of reasons, but I finally came to the conclusion, to be very frank with you, I thought about this, um, I didn't say anything because I didn't want my life reduced to a joke.
that simple. But it took me really some pressing to come to that conclusion because I saw the comic possibilities and I like to make people laugh. But there was a basic level at which I didn't want to do that because it just would have turned the whole experience into a joke and it wasn't a joke for me uh, in any way. So now um, that was on editing and so I would say there's the editor who's marvelous at clarifying and tightening and sharpening. And then there's the editor. I don't mean that they're necessarily separate. There's the editorial move that can say to you, just press on this paragraph a little bit more and you might reveal something that a reader would really cotton to, really connect with. So that's my story about editing. Well, anyway, now back to the book. Where are we, Anne, on time? Back to the book. Do you want to take some questions? Yeah, questions. Okay, any questions? They're going to give the mic to somebody. Okay, sure. We'll have some questions now, and then at 11.30, is that okay if we take, a, take our break? Would that be all right? Oh, sure, everything's fine. I plan to read you uh, one of the essays on the, in the second half. Sure, so. and then perhaps more questions. So if, if we get overwhelmed, we'll still have time to come back. So now we have time for questions. I, I really welcome questions. Don't be, don't be shy, um, but if you don't have any, that's okay. Yeah. Franco, I hope I, I can hear you, you know. Oops. I have my aids on and my glasses on. Is there a question here? Hold on. Hi, Casilla here. How are you? Good. Um, I'm interested in your music composing, and this is because I know nothing about music except what I learn here from time to time. When you're notating the music, and then uh, that means to me you put, the, put it on a staff and all those kinds of things. Do you have an editor for your music after you compose it? No, I get a help book. Um, I'm trying to think of that publisher who brings out such great popular music, and at the moment, I'm having a lapse. But you can get little, I have a little book that spells out for me, it's about this big, how, you know, the, the problem with me is the rests, what's a half, how, the rests, they're very hard to try to remember, even in reading music. So I just, you know, look at the section for rests and go by that, or just use a self-help book. That's my answer to your question. Um, I've never had somebody go over it afterward, though um, a Hudley, a Julian Snow, my teacher, was really interested in these compositions for my granddaughter, which covered years, as you understand. And so when a certain point, I said, if you want to see, see them, here they are. And he thought they were cool, you know. Uh, but he didn't make any, any corrections on them. So no, I, I've never had an editor, and I'm sure there are errors in them. I, I'm sure that there is a way to do that technologically. And I know, uh, for example, Michael Strelo has composed music, and he has something that when you play it on the piano, it comes up automatically. And, and I mean, I know that exists. I'm either nervous, shy, or lazy. I don't know, any one of the above. And I've just never gone that route. There's some, um, there's some value in making yourself just do it, you know? But that's kind of old-fashioned. I realize that. Well, it's not. An, I'll, I'll take it. I need. I need to have something on this side for just now. Hi, my name is Solvay, and I, I do music. Oh. <laughs> um, and I, I oh think. Dear. Oh no, dear. No, 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 no. I'm just. I'm just saying about manuscript. It's wonderful to do it. And but I, the the thing that I would see that you would have a problem with, particularly in rests, are the difference between half and whole notes. Um, because one sits on the rest and sits on a line and the other hangs from a line. And it's really hard to do that by hand. And so I don't know whether you've investigated Sibelius, the program that puts notation on the staff. Bec that's, a, that's a computer program that does that. It doesn't turn things that you play into notation. It, 
lets you type something like a computer, only it makes it totally legible. No, I don't know about that, but I should talk to you afterward about it. Sure. Well, I mean, Julian would know. I, mean, I, I taught here for a while when Julian was an undergraduate. <laughs> so, and, I, and he was incredible then, and I'm really, I'm so proud to see that he's such a wonderful teacher. Yeah. Yeah. I think, yeah. Hi, uh, good morning. My name is Eric. Uh, I'm, I'm right here. I, oh. uh, I was an English major in college, although I've never written fiction or anything, but I had a number of writing courses. And one of our uh, uh, better teachers of writing at the University of Michigan was a fellow named Alan Seeger. And when you speak of editing, he was the first editor of Vanity Fair magazine, but also a writer. But my question is, he always emphasized how important it was for anybody who was interested in writing to keep a journal over the years about their life experiences and what interested them. And the question I had is with your various articles about music that were published in the journals, or in the various journals, were you keeping a journal of your own about your experiences in writing that composition or how you reacted to it or other people reacted to it? I think your teacher was exactly right, really right. And I've regretted that I've never been able to keep a diary or a journal. What I did do, though, particularly in the fiction writing years, so I'll get to the music in a minute, in the fiction writing years, which covered several decades, I kept what I think of as a laboratory. Like I might, um, pick up to, from today's experience. I don't do it now, so don't be nervous. But I might pick up just a little remark that somebody made that I thought, ooh, that's funny. Or one time, for example, I remember I was in a changing my clothes, or in the ladies' room, no, in a restaurant somewhere in Maine or something like that. But in any case, this woman came in, and she's putting on her makeup, and she says, you know, I have so many dresses. I keep one in size 10, one in size 12, one in size 14, and one in size 16. And I think I'm moving toward 18. I thought that was hilarious. So, so that's the kind of thing I might write down. I think of it as a lab. If you're a scientist, you do lab experiment. So I did for many years keep just ring binders in which I would jot down anything I picked up or heard. I'm not as good, honestly, at writing down, this is what I felt today. I'm just not good at that. So I, I know that it's a great release and relief for many people, but I've never been able to really do that. I think of more as a collector of specimens. <laughs> Watch out. <laughs> I don't do that now, so. This is a silly question. Um, this is Evelyn. I know that there are eight notes and obviously endless ways of arranging them. And what I don't understand is with all the, the music that's coming out, isn't there some editor somewhere that checks to see if you haven't arranged them the same way someone else already has? I'm not sure I heard all the question, honestly. Um, I'm not sure I heard all of the question. Uh, I think it had to do with if you've composed something or arranged something, I have done some arranging for myself. Do you check to see that that arrangement has done by somebody else? Is that, was that the question? Yeah, there's various, various publishers have fact checkers, and that would be something that would be yeah. looked at. Uh, I, no, I understand that because I've dealt with copyright, which I'll say a thing about in a minute. No, but no, I haven't checked. But nothing of mine has been published. I mean, published. Anything that I've written down would be just my own notation on a sheet of paper that nobody else would have even seen. So I, I'm not too nervous about this. I was more nervous about copyright issues, which do come up in print for me. And so, for example, um, for a copy of a Wallace Stevens poem, 
I did my dissertation on Wallace Stevens. Don't try it. Uh, but a copy of a Wallace Stevens poems I wanted to use in an essay I hope to read to you later, part of. I paid $107 for the copyright. <laughs> my publisher arranged that, but I paid her. She paid, and then I paid her. And one other uh, brief, oh, last time I was here, I sang for you tiptoe through the tulips. Da 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 You know, an old, old tune. That was costly. I don't remember how much I paid, but it was very complicated. Um, and the publisher went through at least four or five different iterations uh, with various music publishers. You know, so you have to be careful. But I've never, anything I've composed has not been for public presentation in any way. So I've never worried about it. Uh, it disappears. <laughs> I don't know if that really answers the question. I, it, it seemed to me, excuse me for inserting this, but I think maybe what she was asking was, was it discovered that something that you had written had already been written? And, and just because there's only a given number of steps and half steps, they all, and, and I think that maybe wouldn't even be discovered if yours hadn't gone into print. To, to publish print, because in the, in the process of printing something, that's when there's a background check. Yeah. I don't, I don't think I can deal with the question. Uh, I understand the question about ha, or have you printed something that you've composed that has already been effectively already done. Your question. Uh, yeah, I don't know. It's just we had a lecture last month about a piece about con some Hungarian dances that Brahms wrote that once they were published, a, a violinist with whom he'd had a collaboration claimed that he had already written them. It's just, you know, that's kind of a nightmare. And so it's, I think it's just if you've never done music, I mean, just it's so incredibly time consuming for you to put it on paper that I think... I don't think it's questioning your veracity in any sense, just as how in the world do people do this? You know, that's, and that's, that can't be answered. <laughs> there have been several recent articles in the New Yorker about... Microphone? Can you use the microphone for your answer? Thanks. The New Yorkers had several articles recently about when is plagiarism, not plagiarism, and, you know, when has something been used before and you didn't. I mean, I haven't followed them all, but it's a current topic. I do know that, and that's about all I can say. Not a very satisfying answer. Yes, it is. I think it's perfectly, yeah. It's but you can, you might look back if that question enters you. You know, when is a copy really a copy, and when is it really plagiarism, or when has it been made to something else, and when does transformation really alter the original creation. These are very sticky problems, and if you had a lecture pertaining to that, oh my. <laughs> <laughs> okay, on that note, <laughs> that's a bad pun. We will, um, <laughs> thanks for the courtesy laugh. We'll have a 10 minute break and look forward to resuming. I hope this is working. Now I've been elevated. <laughs> I'm going to start by reading you a brief uh, bit. I have everything timed here. This won't take more than eight minutes, eight to 10, is that okay? Okay, this is called Learning to Play. After it, I'll take some more questions if there are some, once I can see this. Once a week, From second through eighth grade, I walked to the end of the, at the end of the school day from St. Margaret's School up the long slope of Willow Street in Waterbury, Connecticut. Can you hear me okay? Turn it. Past, past the hair salon, past the drugstore, past the grocery store and fire station always with two or three firemen relaxing on chairs out front, to my weekly music lesson with Professor John L. Bond, B-O-N-N. After what felt like many blocks, Willow Street turned into Willow Extension, 
left businesses behind and became residential. Rows of large shaded frame houses, two or three stories high, with awninged porches and flowing, flowering bushes out front. Part way up the street on the left, I came to the large gray house with its expansive porch. I'd ring the front doorbell and be greeted by Professor Bon, or sometimes by the mysterious elderly lady who lived with him, Miss Pease, P-E-A-S-E, -E, dressed always in black. Once she let me in, she would silently glide upstairs. That was all I ever knew. Just inside the door, a small waiting area had one wall covered with bookcases, two comfortable chairs, a floor lamp, and a table. Here I sat and waited until Professor Bon appeared from upstairs or finished the lesson before mine in the adjoining room. From the bookcase, I would locate my current book, search out my place marker from last time, and settle down to read. When he finally ushered me into his large double living room plus studio with its fireplace, dark chairs, standing lamps, and two grand pianos at the far end, he would adjust the pile of yellow music books on the piano bench in front of the piano I was allowed to play. Each year, he adjusted the height of the pile for my size. In a cordial, encouraging, but somewhat formal atmosphere, he created an hour that was all about music. No social frills. He seemed ancient, Professor Bonn. His origins were mysterious. Germany, we thought. He was ugly. A big mole on his right cheek sprouted a hair. I didn't like to look at it. A tall man, always in a shiny dark suit, white tie, white shirt and tie, he walked with a slight stoop, and his spotted hands trembled, except when he set them on the keyboard. At the parish high mass on Sundays, he played the organ up in the balcony and sometimes sang parts of the mass in his faint, quavery voice. As the lesson proceeded, on each piece of music, his shaky hand would write the metronome marking I was to aim for during the next week's practice. Week after week, he would move it up a notch. Then, that somehow, was a minor part of the lesson. Surely he knew that at home I avoided the metronome. He would often write a chord symbol above it. G7, don't worry about these, they're just symbols for various chords for those of you who don't, aren't familiar with them. He would, he would write uh, above each piece of music, he would write the name of a chord. I've got to skip from it. G7 for the dominant seventh, the small circle for the diminished chord, the plus sign for the augmented card, chord, and so on in that way from very early on. He trained me to look at notation as a key to something else, the harmonic structure, the chord progression that those black notes signified. Though important, simply reading notes was never enough. He demonstrated how those patterns worked, what they, and he would say it this way, what they said. And he would play a dominant seventh chord, a certain chord we're familiar with, and he would say, hear it crying to go home, and then he would wait and say to me, find its home. And I had to find where that chord was crying to go. 
I now realize he was introducing me to a whole other language. It's grammar, the meanings it could hold, <clears throat> its rhetorical implications, and though he never talked that way, that's what he communicated. He simply moved from one piece to another along the way, <clears throat> excuse me, choosing samples of whatever seemed appropriate to my progress, <clears throat> my interest, my needs, my talents, or my indolence. This was all classical music with substantial doses of Beethoven. I played only one Debussy, which I recall, Claire de Lune, of course, but he occasionally lightened my programs with Nola or Juba or the Gollywog's Cakewalk. <clears throat> Wait a minute. Sorry. On my own, far away from Professor Bond, I would hunt out sheet music for the day's popular songs and learn them. He resided far from the world of Frank Sinatra. I had no exposure ever to a traditional music series book. However, he forced me to create my own. For each week's lesson, I had to write out what we call one, four, and five chords for a specific key. And then, I don't mean to insult you, but for those who do not know, every chord has different um, positions it can be put in, three. So he would not only have me write out the chords, one, four, and five, but take each one in its three positions and write those all out. And then he would have me write out, this was all before I came to my music lesson, this is my homework, find the basic or tonic chord that went with each of those. Over time, I covered every key and wrote as well the appropriate root and the bass clef along with the chords. Later teachers would point out aspects of harmony in a piece, but never, never with such consistency, week by week, over so many years. I need to say here something because I don't think I'll have time to read it, but in the composing for Claire, I, of course, was totally dependent on those chords. Where do you start? I started with Professor Bonn, who made me, or yes, really made me. I was taking lessons from him, and I'm in second grade. I don't know how he got me to do that. I was very earnest about learning music, but I'm second and third grade doing this, all this writing out. But it's what carried me through life, because I was always learning the popular music on my own. I would go down to the record store, where you could play records of contemporary music, I mean, a pop pop, you know, and I wanted to learn all that stuff. And because he had given me some basics, real basics, I sort of could do it. And it really has carried me through life, so I owe a great deal to him. It carried me through composing for Claire, that's for sure. Now I'm going to have you do another little <clears throat> experiment. This is experimenting with touch. He wanted to teach me about adjust, um, distributing the weight when you play the piano. I hope you can hear me. You're all sitting there. I want this. oh dear, stretch your hands out straight. Now, just drop your wrists, only your wrists. Now consciously think about the weight you feel there, okay? Now, take your elbows and spread them out as if you were a bird like this. Now consciously think about the weight of your hands, the, the weight your shoulders are supporting, the weight of your arms, and now with a big plop, let it all go. <laughs> I, 
I went through this almost each week with him. I certainly do it still now to remind myself of the importance of weight management. I mean, it's in the brain, really, I think. And I'm not sure that it's altered my life. But that was how he approached alerting a child, you know, like a big bird or something, um, to the significance of various parts of your body and the weight that they brought to bear on touch at the piano. OK, I have to find my place here. Together, we explored the different ways of touching a key and its effects. Chopin students tell of his strategies to elicit as many kinds of sounds from striking a key as there are fingers. Professor Bond would urge me to play a staccato note, just one note, not a bunch, just one. Then he'd say to me, watch it. See it dance. I mean, this is to a third year old, a third grader, you know. See it dance. Can you hear the difference? This was not a question to excite a grammar school child. <laughs> Gradually, though, I came to hear something of the keyboard's possible sound effects. And now I go through describing the exercise I just put you through, so I'll skip that. And then he would have me drop all my hands and plop them. He would demonstrate creating the look of a great black-sleeved bird with extended arm wings bent in half. Now let the full weight of your forearms, your loose hands, just hang there, supported by your shoulders. Can you feel that weight? Again, I would nod, this tedious old man. When could I play? That was always the question. Now let the whole thing go, let it drop, I obeyed, and then finally we would get to the playing. To this day, I sometimes use this exercise to remind myself about weight distribution at the keyboard. Commenting on Rubenstein's mastery of weight control, his use of body and shoulder weight in his forte sections, his relaxed wrists, we've all seen that with piano players, his relaxed wrist, his ability to elicit a singing tone. One commentator, Yosef Levine, sums it all up. Here's his comment. There's a vast difference between amateur hammering on the keyboard for force and the more artistic means of drawing the tone from the piano by weight or pressure properly controlled and administered. That's touch. Subsequent teachers in high school, 20 years later in Chicago and now in Oregon, taught me much, I suspect. However, I think the first piano teacher may matter the most. Professor Bond walked me steadily through scales, arpeggios, chords, and exercises never pushing me through Hannon. For those who don't know Hannon, Hannon is the dreaded exercise book. Anyway, he never, I mean, I, I got it as an adult here. I was curious, what was Hannon anyway? So I went and bought a copy and looked at it. Oh my God. <laughs> he never pushed me through Hannon. Despite his meticulous and rigorous attention to details of technique, somehow, what breathed through the lessons was always music, not mechanics. Had it not been so, I surely would have given up. I had no desire ever to be a professional musician. That holds to this day. I was just a determined little girl who wanted to learn how to make music. So that's my first reading. <laughs> Um, I, I should pause and say, are there any questions about that? Because I know we have music teachers in the room, and that should make me nervous, but everybody's experience is different. Oh, you can't hear me. Are there any questions? I have another thing I can read. Just if we save questions to the end, because we want to be sure that you get through your material. Oh, OK. Well, um, is there another gathering after lunch? Oh, this is it. OK, I should know that. Okay, come in, come in, come in.
This is a brief one called A Golden Escape. As you know, some of you know, my husband plays the banjo. And I've watched him learn from the bottom up. The banjo is a tough instrument. And uh, he learned from the bottom up over the years in Canada and in the States. So this is uh, a little anecdote about what it was like in Canada in terms of making music with other people. He's my other people in this one. S sorry. Sackville, New Brunswick, Canada, 1980, and the years following. New Brunswick winters could be brutally cold. Morning CBC radio would caution children against playing atop snow mounds lest they touch electric wires overhead. They were also advised to wear face masks against the chill factor lest minutes in the cold freeze their faces. We're aware of this all right now, of course, in our country. In such a world, few things comfort like the smell of burning logs crackling in the fireplace, tantalizing aromas from the kitchen, and the promise of rich carbohydrates later. Winter flab became our seasonal costume. <laughs> Snow could persist into May, so we sought to create a warming cocoon, and eventually we found one Saturday afternoon at the Met. I'm going to interview to say, inter interrupt for a minute to say, I was not raised on the opera. I had no contact. I was not the child in the little maroon dress brought to the Met. No, none of that. Uh, we didn't have any opera in our house. My mother could play the violin, and my father was totally tone deaf, really. And so um, opera was not part of my background. So this was a real discovery in Canada on a cold day. Um, what the opera could do for you. Upstairs, one son might be listening to his tapes, definitely not opera. The other son might be outside sliding on packed snow or skating. They both skated. We would close the doors to the living room, get a fire going, pull down the new Milton Cross complete stories of great operas, read up on the plot, and listen. No super texts to guide us, just music. All that glorious caterwauling, as my older son still calls it. At intermission, I would set up tea and something calorically decadent on the coffee table and listen and sip. While stone cold earth outside wrapped itself in the snug silence of falling snow, we inhabited another world. It was our weekly trill, embellishing a monochrome winter, a musical magic carpet <clears throat> to fly us from wind and snow and village life onto the great gold curtain stage of passion, love, betrayal, intrigue, murder, disguise, inevitable ending coughing as you sing a great aria and happy endings. Here I was, decades away from my first wondering exposure to opera as a child, in my closest friend's household in Waterbury, Connecticut. I would go to visit Margaret. I would go in the front door, full of vim and vigor as a young child, and everybody in the house would have their eyes shut, and it would be like, shh. They would be tiptoeing around fingers on the lips, and I would be told, shh, it was Saturday afternoon at the opera. Her father had, in fact, been asked to audition for the Met, so he had a beautiful voice, footnote here, and one of my pleasures as a child would be when he came to visit at our house with my parents, he would sing and I would accompany him. Beautiful voice. Anyway. Let the skies outside drop buckets of snow away from our home country. We were in Canada. We had Germont singing of his home country. La Traviata. Healthy ourselves, we sipped tea as Violetta gasped her last, always with a gorgeous aria. You realize that's required in opera. Uh, tuberculosis doesn't seem to interfere with 
great soprano singing. <laughs> uh, distant from riots raging in American streets, this is the late 60s, early 70s. We thrill to Scarpia, evil man, Scarpia's malevolence, evil policeman, and Rigoletto's despairing pain of discovery and loss. This weekly trill played counterpoint to regular rhythmic teaching, writing, caring for sons, cooking, cleaning, wondering if non-existent spring would ever come and what kind of sweet treat could I create next? So that's my little bit on opera for you. I'm looking for time. Okay. Um, keep those who are required to, when I put on my glasses, I can't see any of you, but I can see the text. When I take off my glasses, you all look stunning, <laughs> but I can't read the print. A little pro I'm doing a project now because of course I have obvious eye problems as probably 98% of the people in this world do. <clears throat> For 15 minutes every day I play blind. <clears throat> I'm, I'm trying to learn one standard of a t at a time, old standards. I have three down. <clears throat> I play blind. And it takes time, but it is interesting to know that Chopin advised his pupils to practice in total darkness. Because that way they would internalize the keyboard, the distances, the notes, basically that they wanted to play. So I'm in the process of doing that from 10 to 15 minutes a day. You know, it's interesting, that's all I can say. <laughs> I have down, I'm on smoke gets in her eyes. I mean, that's ironic, smoke gets in her eyes. And all the things you are and embraceable you. Those three I've got down so far. Okay, I'm going to read a little bit from compo Composing for Claire since I talked to you about it. It's a simple story. A new being enters the world. I feel the urge to celebrate, search for an appropriate gesture. I decide that each year I'll compose a piece on the piano to celebrate this birth, this mystery. Granddaughter arrives, rejoice. Simple story, except that no story is simple. Foreign elements intrude, enrich, complicate the narrative. Backstory from one's life makes itself felt at unexpected moments. Nonetheless, the basic plot line has continued now through 14 birthdays, each November. A piece by Grandma Cookie appears in black ink on colored paper, three holes punched so Claire can insert it in her special binder, Claire's Musique Book Line. As I write this, I have come to the end of the project. I said to Claire when she graduated from eighth grade, this is it, Claire. You're going off to a new adventure in a few months, high school. No more annual birthday pieces. You will be into a new life. If you fall in love, though, call me up, and I'll see if I can compose you a ballad. <laughs> Claire now has an official boyfriend, and I'm waiting for the telephone call. <laughs> Moving on. What difference could it possibly make to compose a song each year? Time's passing intensifies this question for me. I was not naive. I had a pretty good sense of the effort it would require, nor did I feel particularly confident. On the contrary, I felt embarrassed, and at the same time, a bit pretentious, when I finally said to my son and daughter-in-law, each year, I hope to write a piece for Claire's birthday. They took it calmly. I had never thought I'd become a grandmother. Religious life cancels any such expectations. So now the surprise Grandma Cookie would try to compose. In the earlier years, I played with her. In recent years, I've played 
Uh, in recent years, I've played with her, improvised to her bass, read forehand compositions, and fooled around with her on the keyboard. While I was visiting one year, I noted a certain leap in her ability, that's the way things happen in music at least, chug, 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 chug along, and then all of a sudden there's a sort of little leap. I think it happens in athletics too. Suddenly you can do it, or do it better. So it was a Saturday morning, we were in Seattle, and Claire, at her father's request, of course, was playing for us Beethoven's Sonatina in G, the first movement. When she finished, I said to her, you want to have some fun and out Beethoven, Beethoven? Now, as I read this, you might think back to 145 and Professor Bonn. Always game, she slid over on the piano bench and I sat down at the top end. We were familiar with this arrangement from playing duets. As she again played her Beethoven, I fumbled some harmonies in the upper register in the key of G. She was wedded to notes, of course, yet saw me wandering around the keyboard without sheet music in front of me as I searched for what was possible in the moment. She knew I'd been studying jazz improv for a few years. And after years of reading classical and pop music, I was trying to free myself from depending on notation. Play the scale of G for me, I asked. Easily done, nimble little fingers. She was quite good on the piano. Now show me the triad or chord of G major. That's do me so. Easily done. D major, easily done. C major, ditto. Ready to roll. Now I said, as I play, just watch my left hand. And I showed her again, reminding her the three basic triads she had just before, minutes before, so easily herself found on the keyboard. Now I said, I'll play the top that Beethoven wrote for us. But you keep your eye on <clears throat> excuse me, my left hand, and you'll see he's using exactly the chords that you yourself just played for me. We fooled around like this for a bit. The whole process occupied perhaps five minutes. It was fun. And then she was off to play with Delilah, her cat. Once again, I felt grateful to my first piano teacher, Professor Bonn, who had assigned me long before Claire's age to write the chords and symbols for the tonic, the subdominant, and the, and the uh, tonic in a specified key before each lesson. It seemed so useless then, a total bother, unrelated to the exciting power of calling forth music from a keyboard. However, I was earnest, as I already said, as a child. One moment occurred here in Salem that had solidified my resolve to do this. Shortly after Claire was born, my husband and I went out for dinner at McGrath's, a local fish restaurant. As usual, we chatted up our waitress, this time a slim, shy student at the university from which I'd just retired. I missed a chance for free PR there. Suddenly, in the course of our exchange, she said, my grandpa writes songs for me, and her face lit up. Her words touched me, her delight, and I remembered that. Her grandpa had bridged time and found a way into her heart. He had, moreover, offered her access to a bit of joy. Could I do that? I'm skipping. A little later, whoops, I'm sorry. Um, she is now older. I figured 
What would a five-year-old child want to hear about her life? There were her friends, and I named them, her teachers, her swimming lessons, her ballet lessons, all these privileged children, her Sunday school teachers. There as well her chickens, her cat, and the gerbil, forget the gerbil. And so I took her upstairs to her little bedroom, and she sat under her child-sized yellow table. And I tried to squeeze underneath myself. I remember the moment. Took a sheet of her orange paper and a crayon, and I began to quiz her. Because I'd reached the point, as I mentioned earlier, where I knew maybe words were really, it was time for some words. When I could pry her attention away from the little girl's mirror above her table, she answered my questions. I wrote it all down, and then I went home and got to work. Over the years, Claire's interviews expanded. At 11, she filled out a long email questionnaire about the personalities of her latest chickens, her current best friends, her favorite authors, and singers. Later, she included what she hoped to be and do with her life. Basically, this boiled down to saving the world, starting with the environment. This is a Pacific Northwest girl. More recent answers at 13 and 14 added the note, I'll write and sing music and become a star. One final note on how I understand music's power. It's, it's the end of composing for Claire. You've heard enough of that. Music subverts the inevitability of ending. Decades ago, those shakily penciled in symbols of my childhood's music pages had opened portals to another world my aged teacher could never have imagined. They have led to years of discovery and pleasure. More recently, another teacher, Julian Snow, had opened even more doors into musical freedom through improvisation. My final comment, who can fathom how layers of our years work their way into the songs we sing? of our own lives, or the stories we tell of others. A written symbol lies flat on the page, as do these words on this page. And yet, as any reader knows, a symbol implies acres of meaning. Exploring that space has occupied musicians and readers for centuries. My words and the notes written on those brightly colored pages are not bound just to those pages. They constitute, really, a symbolic gesture, as much toward the future as toward the present birthday. They spring from a mix of realism and hope, heartfelt gratitude set forth in odd-looking black symbols sprinkled across messy pages to sing a life. And so, not surprisingly, the story of composing for Claire turns out to be not so simple. I have 18, 19 minutes after. Aren't I supposed to stop at 20 after? No, we finished at, 11, at half past, so we've got I'm, time for questions. I'm I thought I had this down pat, but um, I have up, up all these possibilities that I can read and timing next to each ah, one of them. Yeah. That's why I keep saying how much time is mm -hmm, left. Right. Okay. So were you ready for questions now? Or are you? Oh, sure. <laughs> okay. If there are any questions. Oh, there will be. Otherwise, I have a two-minute thing. I can... yeah, if you don't mind, I'm going to just put a quick postscript on one of the things that she mentioned were the, 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 the three basic triads that are one, four, and five in the position of, of a key. And they're 
relative positions. But what that meant was that every triad, let's just say C, E, G, has three ways of appearing. as C on the bottom, E in the middle, G on the top. Or you can have it what we call first inversion. You flip it over once, and what was the middle is now the bottom, right? On the, on the second inversion, what was the top one is now the bottom with the other two. Just keep turning them over. Those are a, a core position and first inversion and second inversion. And she said, oh, I'm sure you all know that. But I think there might be two of you that didn't know that before. <laughs> I'm sorry. <clears throat> I don't want there. to insult you. You know, it's tricky in this, with this audience. Okay, over there. Uh, this is Barbara. I'm, I have a non-musical question. Uh, how did you choose your... Oh, I'm over here on the To the other, the other side. right. How did you choose your pseudonym? Oh, oh, that's easy. And it's musical, too. I have to remember to use this. Um, when we lived in Chicago for three years or so, I had been away from the piano many, many years. I had been teaching in the convent and then playing an electric organ up in Canada, but I never had direct access to much piano. And um, this is crazy. I asked my mother, a saint she was, I think, to send me out from Connecticut my chickering upright piano. I mean, really? What was I thinking of? She was sympathetic and she did it. And it came to Chicago where I had no piano. I really don't know what I would, well, I wanted a piano and never mind, let's move on. So uh, down the street from us on South Hyde Park Boulevard, there was a very distinguished musician who was kind of Mr. Music of Chicago. When, when opera stars came, they would practice with him. He ran a studio. You had to audition to get accepted by him. Um, and uh, he was about two blocks down the street on South Hyde Park Boulevard. And so I sought to take lessons from him. And um, I remember I played the raindrop prelude for my audition and got in, and, and he became a very, very dear friend to both my husband and me. His name was Gavin Copeland Williamson. When I started to write and the first book was coming out, I called to Chicago. I wasn't there, I wasn't no longer there. We were now in Canada, and I said, um, would you mind if I took your name? And so I sought his permission, so that's the Copeland. And our son, Tom's middle name is Gavin. So these were ways that I could honor that great musician and great teacher. So the Anne is my own name. Anne is my middle name without an E. I have an E on my middle name and none on Ann Copeland. But the name was really to honor the music teacher, Gavin Copeland Williamson, who had come originally from Canada. It was an odd thing. Yeah, Ann? Hi, I'm Karen Bender. I'm right over here. I'm looking, I'm looking. Oh. <laughs> oh. Oh, yes, I see. Okay, and you have given a gift to your granddaughter each year, you know, in the past. And how did you give that to her? Was it wrapped in a picture, like the one that you have in front here? Or? No, um, that's a good question. Um, uh, each, I decided each piece, each piece should be on brightly colored paper. So there would be like the first piece on green paper, then the next year purple paper, etc. And I would notate it, as I've said, and punch three holes and put it in a plain old ordinary three ring binder. And I think I made some kind, I didn't make it, but I had some kind of a cover. I maybe, you know how you can slip something down the cover sometime? I, I think I probably slipped down the cover a little musical symbol. That I don't remember. 
what I do remember is each year seeing my, I would bring the sheets of paper up to her with the three holes punched, and I'd see it go in the book, and then I'd see it go up on the shelf, you know, with the boots and the scarves and the, yeah. So that's really all I can say about it, but that's how I did it. Sheets of paper in a three, three ring binder, and then each year I gave her the sheets of paper and she kept the binder. Who knows where it is, but I should finish the story quickly and say, I thought I should do something more, and so at a certain point I thought, I should have these sung and recorded. Now nobody does CDs now, I know that. But I was going to make a CD, this is some years ago. She's now 20, she was then 14 and a few years after. So I asked around, I thought, you know, who would take on learning all these songs, 14, in different keys, with a different voice range, because I hadn't, of course, planned on a, a certain singer. And I found a student at Willamette um, who really had loved her grandmother. I mean, how sentimental can we get here? But it is true, she wanted to take this on once she heard about the project. So over the next year, I paid her for each song she learned. Um, she uh, and I would go through the songs at my house. She would come when she could. And it took probably a year and um, she made her living wage, and then how, what would I do with all that? Well, um, Mike Nord, who teaches here at Willamette and is a very skilled musician and editor, is a sound editor, so he sound edited for me, and we got it onto a CD, and then I gave it to Claire as a CD. I think, you know, as soon as I could, like the next Christmas when it was all done. So that's the end of the story. Uh, <clears throat> hi, my name's Pat. Uh, I'm really interested in all your stories you have, especially about you and your granddaughter, Claire. <laughs> and I hope you come back and share with us why you became a nun and why you dropped out being a nun. I think that'd be real fascinating. Thank you. <laughs> That's, a, you know, um, many years ago, here is really gratuitous self-promotion. You ready? I wrote a book called The Golden Thread, um, which is fiction, but is based closely on my experience of all those years as a nun, and um, begins as I'm a child in Connecticut. And it amazes me that when I say it still sells, we mean like five copies a year. You realize this is, I mean, uh, this is way, way back. But nonetheless, that just amazes me. Um, I wanted to give my life to God. How's that for the simple answer? And that's the truth of it. And then um, in the story reunion, I think it's a little naked there. My own, I, I wait, I had seven years of making the decision, basically. Um, but I think if, if you do, <laughs> this is not hard sell, I'm just trying to answer your question. If you do look at the book, it's in, by the way, it's in the Willamette Library as well. <clears throat> uh, you'll find that I address the question a bit there, not so much of, why would one would want to enter the convent? Because in the tradition that I grew up in, it was really the uh, noblest gesture you could make of gratitude for a life. That's a whole tradition. But uh, in the story reunion, you'll find a little soul searching and a little candor about many years later at the reunion, in fact, remembering some of the more painful moments of deciding to leave, okay? I don't know how much more publicly I could say. I'm perfectly open about it, but I don't know how much I could say that would make sense. I know that it is a story that intrigues people often, and I didn't want to make that pitch in the book 
about music or in um, seeking out publishers for the book. Uh, if I put in I was a monastic nun, it was because there's a particularly long essay that deals with my love for Gregorian chant. Well, I mean, give me a break. How many people feel that way? As my one of my piano partners recently said, I can't stand it. Oh, I said, that's not unusual. <laughs> Any more questions? I think <clears throat> we're out of time. Okay. But I'd like you to say two sentences about this beautiful piece of... Oh artwork in front of you. I know the artwork in front of me. Veni Sancte Spiritus, et emite celitus, luces tu eradium. This is the Veni Sancte. <laughs> OK. Uh, this is the Veni Sancte Spiritus. Um, which I uh, acquired many, many years ago in Marshall Fields in Chicago, where a man was selling many, many copies that had been from a dismembered liturgical book, breviary, and this was one of them. And I was so struck by this. I mean, I'm not in the convent. I'm, a, I'm, I'm in my clothes cruising the color aisles at Marshall Fields. I was going to read that, but we don't have time. So I come downstairs, and here is this guy selling these pieces of beautiful uh, vellum with chant on it, and I start to sing. Now give me a break. Because it was so evocative for me. I had taught choir practically in every house, and I had to learn ictus, padatus, epizema, all the stuff about Gregorian chant. Um, so when I found this, I said, can I go through them? And I found the Veni Sancti Spiritus, which I particularly like. It's from Pentecost, if that means anything to you. Um, so I bought that piece. and. Um, I still love it. I brought it from our living room. We got it framed, and I keep it above my piano. The reason I left here was I was going to translate for them, but I can't. This is worth two seconds. Um, come. Father of the poor, come, giver of gifts, come, light of the heart, consolator optime, O greatest consoler, come, sweet guest, come, <laughs> um, uh, sweet refresher, come. And then there is a series of addresses like in labore requies, namely in labor rest, in us two temperies. Uh, in coldness, warmth, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And then it ends with, fill our hearts, O uh, Holy Spirit. And I hung that above the piano, figuring I need all the help I can get. 